All right, and we're talking about Paul's pattern here, and I just want to go back over the first couple of verses here uh, that I think are important for you to grab a hold of. Uh, Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and then we'll jump right in. He says, For yourselves, brethren, know the entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. And Paul's saying to you, but it, it wasn't worth anything. It counted for something. It mattered that we were there. And then he said, But even after we had suffered before, were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much intention. Uh, Brother Brian Chase, would you please open a prayer, please, sir? All right, thank you. I want you to be seated. Now, I want to bring out just something else I mentioned carefully to you uh, this morning. I didn't go to the whole thing, but the Apostle Paul had been jailed and Paul had been uh, beaten and Paul had been taken advantage of. More than just words were spoken to Paul. He uh, suffered greatly and shamefully entreated, meaning that he wasn't welcomed wherever he went. But what I want you to see in verse number two is the fact is it didn't prevent him from continuing to boldly preach the gospel. The mindset that you have to have is, is when you're doing what God would have you to do, sometimes a poor treatment comes as a result. And the bad thing that can happen to you is, is that if you go into it expecting everybody to rejoice over the fact that you are there or that you're telling them about the Lord, you're going in and you're going to be sadly disappointed. And that has to do sometimes with uh, churches too, not just saved individuals, uh, I mean, excuse me, unsaved individuals, but saved individuals. They don't appreciate sometimes you're trying to help them. And so sometimes you become the target because you're the one that went and spoke to them. The issue you want to get out of that is, is that even though Paul was treated the way he was treated, he didn't quit. And Paul's going to give you some reasons here and some things that they did. And if there was anything that I appreciate about the Apostle Paul, probably as much as uh, all the things that he wrote is the fact that he didn't have any quit in him. Paul didn't ever come along and say, you know what, I've had enough of this now. And I mean, you might consider him to be somewhat suicidal if you were to look at him. You'd take the, Paul, the Apostle Paul and think to himself, man, why do you keep putting yourself in a position that you keep getting mistreated the way you get mistreated? Paul wasn't ever looking for the easy road. We read through that this morning about how he was treated. And Paul says, are they ministers? I more. And then he describes what the ministry is. But what I appreciate about the Apostle Paul is, and imagine where we would be if the Lord had to find somebody else because Paul said, well, this isn't what I signed up for. Do you understand the Apostle Paul, when he first started out, ladies and gentlemen, he was the who's who of any religious movement that there was. Paul was trained at the feet of Gamil. That's probably the Perry, y'all don't know Perry Mason. That's probably the greatest lawyer of that day. I don't know who a lawyer is nowadays. It's certainly not uh, Johnny Cochran from over in California, but he, I think he's gone now. But, but at any rate, a great lawyer. Paul had a law degree. Paul was very, very smart. Paul had the ability and had risen through the ranks now. And Paul would have been the chief of everything you're talking about. And Paul cast all of those things aside. So the apostle Paul knows and clearly understands what he's talking about when he says, I was shamefully entreated, as opposed to when the apostle Paul showed up before. Well, I mean, he's the guy, they would grab his horse and take care of his horse and they would make sure he stayed in the best accommodations. They'd make sure he had the best of foods. It would be an honor to have the apostle Paul sit at your table. There'd be a wait list of individuals that wanted to sit down with the apostle Paul and have him be there at the table. Paul had the ability, Paul had the authority to be able to put people in jail. Paul had the ability to have them executed. Paul had the ability and if he wanted to, to hold a tribunal or to hold a court case if he wanted. Paul could do anything. He was at the top of the heap. And now all of a sudden, Paul said, now that I've been preaching the gospel, I haven't been greeted with open arms. I'm preaching the gospel to the enemies of Christ, the people that wanted nothing to do with Christ. Now, you live in America, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm grateful to live in America. I'm not ashamed to live in America. I don't hold my head down when I go to another country because I'm an American. I'm an American. I'm not ashamed of that. 
But I appreciate the fact, I remember uh, uh, Vanya telling us when we went to Moldova, uh, several of us went over there, and that was a great trip. But when I was standing there, it was real cold one day, we're out there passing out tracks on the corner, and, and I, people wouldn't even look at me. And he walked up to me and he said, I said, I don't understand, they, they're like walking around me and that kind of thing. And he said, uh, you're wearing sunglasses. And I said, well, the sun's bouncing off the snow and it hurts my eyes. And he said, but that's an offense to them. And I said, okay. So I took my sunglasses off and put them in my pocket. And then he said, you need to spit your chewing gum out. He said, that's an offense to them. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking to yourself, well, too bad, tough apples, who cares? He said, listen, you're never going to get to know these people. And as far as they're concerned, you're nothing more than an American. And they don't like you at all. As a matter of fact, they hate you. I said, they don't even know me. He said, they're never going to know you. But if you want a chance to put a gospel track in their hand or to maybe bring a flyer and ask them to come to a meeting or something, he said, there's a way that you can at least bridge that gap a little bit. But I realize, ladies and gentlemen, just because we're there, their concept of an American is people that have gone over there and take advantage of them. So when they're looking at the Apostle Paul, they're looking at the Apostle Paul and saying the Jews have always hated us and always despised us. And Paul is doing his best to try to help them the best way he knows how to help them. But you got to remember, he's still a Jew and Gentiles hated Jews. Now, I don't know about you, but that's an uncomfortable position to be in. If you pause and think about that for just a little while and imagine what it must be like to try to win somebody to Jesus Christ and they hate you. But you know what the Apostle Paul said? Paul said, it didn't matter. We still did what we were supposed to do. We didn't quit. We still remain bold. But notice, not just because we're bold and have a backbone like a saw log, we remain bold in God. We're doing what God would have us to do. Christians nowadays could learn something from that. Christians nowadays could learn, okay, I don't have to be a smart aleck and you get ready to get up from the restaurant and, and put a track on the table. I don't have to be a smart aleck if somebody says, I don't want that. Well, you don't know where that comes from. That don't, don't all of a sudden take that personal. What it might be is, is the last person who left a gospel track wound up leaving them 50 cents. I mean, I hate to say this, Christians are horrible tippers. A lot of people don't have a place to go to, for uh, eating on Sunday afternoon because the, 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 uh, the crowd, the employees, the, what, what do you call them now? You call them wait staff. Can you, can't, can you call them waiters anymore? The people that wait on your table, the waitresses and the waiters, they don't want to work on Sunday. Do you know why? Because they're religious, because they go to church. And all, no, they don't want to deal with church people. You say, why? They tell me church people are the worst tippers there are. So when you leave a tip with, I mean, a, 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 a track with a 50 cent tip, you know what they think? Typical church people. Well, we used to be uh, downtown. We had to work the parking lot a lot of years ago. And back in those days, there's no stripes. It's all gravel and dirt there. And if it rained, it was muddy. And that, you know, I mean, muddy enough, you had to wear rubber boots. And that's part of what came with riding a motor. And you had to wind up working at the Coliseum or you had to work the Gator Bowl. And they didn't have all that fancy stuff. Brother Ron's sitting back there, he can tell you, he's one that trained me on how to learn to work with that kind of stuff. It takes a tremendous amount of patience and those kind of things. And you'd be in there and you know where you couldn't hardly find anybody to work? I mean, they're paying us almost, you know, what you would call almost time and a half to park cars. So that's pretty good money, right? You know what? You couldn't hardly find anybody who wanted to work on Sunday. You say, why? I mean, when they had these special events down there that were religious events, you know why? Because that's the worst crowd you ever dealt with. Everybody wants to back in. Everybody wants to park somewhere special. Everybody wants to complain about somebody else. You couldn't find individuals that wanted to work back then paying us about $25 an hour to park cars. To park cars. And you couldn't find people that wanted to come out there and work. You say, why? Dealing with religious people. I don't want to be the kind of person that because of, just because of my attitude, people don't like me. But if they don't like me because of the gospel I'm presenting, then they have to just not like me because of the, of the gospel I'm presenting. But that doesn't mean you have to always be a porcupine, porcupine in your delivery. I mean, sometimes you have a face and make an undertaker cry. 
And, you know, don't you want to know Jesus? You know, oh, fine, go to hell then, you know, and that kind of a thing. And, you know, that, they listen to how you talk and, and come through the parking lot. Watch how you treat the cashier. Watch how you treat the person that doesn't wait on you at Walmart. And then you want to go up there and, like you're checking a box. They pick up on that. I mean, I have something exciting to tell them. If I don't, you know what I do sometimes? I just don't tell them. I mean, you know, I, get, I have a bad mood every now and then. I'm sorry. I'm glad y'all don't. I'm glad you wake up in the morning. I pray every one of you wakes up every morning. But Monday mornings are hard for me, especially fly out days. It's kind of like, man, that clock goes off early and I wake up and I don't spring out of bed anymore. <laughs> the springs are rusted now. <laughs> And I get up and I'm thinking, do I really want to do this? And man, that's a long way. And boy, it sure is good. And I, I get to thinking about what it is I'm doing. That gets me excited. Uh, but if somebody were to catch me at the ticket counter first thing in the morning, I might better have had a coffee, a cup of coffee or two before I get there. You say, why? They're watching you from the second you come in the door. Where are you going? Hello today, sir. How are you? Nice to see you. Where are you headed now? Oh, I'm headed to so-and-so. Really? What are you going to be doing over there? I'm a preacher. What's it to you? <laughs> Just stamp the ticket and let me go, all right? I got to go. I'm going to get hung up in TSA. I know somebody's going to have a bad day over there, and they're going to jack me up and run the wand over me and pull me off to the side and grab my luggage and take all my stuff out. I mean, the last time that I was here, I mean, they ran me through the ringer. It's kind of like, hmm. You know, we got something for you. And then they, you leave the ticket counter and they dial and say, here he comes. <laughs> and what I'm trying to say to you is, is that Paul, in spite of how he was treated, he remained bold in God and he remained, he remained mission minded. Amen. You have to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that part of that causes spiritual opposition. The one thing the devil cannot stand, he does not care if you talk about anything else, even church stuff, right the dividing or whatever. But when you get into the realm of trying to get somebody's soul out of hell, all of a sudden you have stepped into something, you are messing with his kids. Let me give you this and I'm going to come to the passage. Now, those of you that have children or you're close to children, imagine this, some weirdo, some freako is peeping in your window and he's trying to do his best to pull one of your kids out of the bed at night and do ungodly and unspeakable things to him. What would your attitude toward that individual be? I mean, I'm going to be willing to bet you, some of you, even though you're just as meek as a kitten, I bet if they bet up, I bet Mama Bear will come out. I bet old Grizzly Bear will come out. I mean, I bet there'll be a side of you that'll wind up showing that ain't never showed up before, right? In the name of Jesus. All right, now imagine when you go to pull one of the devil's kids out of hell, how do you think he feels about that? He takes it personal. It makes a difference to him. If you recognize that when you're going in there, you'll recognize you're not playing patty cake. That's why the devil doesn't care if you get all twisted up with each other and you get twisted up with everything that you do at the church and all your service and all this and other stuff. He doesn't care about that. But when you start messing with souls, yep. he doesn't care how much you grow in the Lord. He doesn't care how much you learn about the Bible, how intellectual you become. But when you start going for souls, that's why it's hard to be a soul winner. That's why it's hard to do those things. So the Apostle Paul says to you in verse number two, we became bold in our God to speak the gospel with much what? Contention. There's contention. You ever been having a decent conversation and everything's going good? Maybe you're sitting next to a guy there on the plane and you get ready to go through things and then all of a sudden you haven't had any service at all and now all of a sudden everybody wants to give you service? You ever have an opportunity to be sitting down with somebody in a library or a cup of coffee or somewhere at one of the coffee shops and the Lord opens the door and you start talking to them and then all of a sudden that contention is not always a verbal uh, uh, obstruction that takes place. Sometimes it's just an interruption. Why? There's somebody's soul in the balance. And out of the blue, all of a sudden, I remember being with the old preacher, we were over off of uh, Ricker, I think it was Ricker Road, or might have been Schindler Drive. Anyway, there was a place over there, it was a juvenile facility. And uh, it was a big juvenile facility. The man's name that ran the thing at the time, the last name was Malik, M-E-L-E-E-K. Uh, and uh, he was in that place, and we were in there preaching, and the preacher got ready to preach on the devil-possessed man of Gadarene. 
And he told me when I was setting up the board, he said, now you can expect anything in the world to happen <clears throat> when I'm up here to preach today. And I said, why is that? He said, I'm going to preach on the devil-possessed man of Gadarene. And every time I do, something always happens. And I said, okay, you know, well, I mean, what are you thinking might happen? I mean, you're in a juvenile facility in a lockdown, and the people that are there are in orange pajamas. I mean, you're thinking, how much opposition can there be? So we sit there, and the guys sitting on the front row, all of a sudden, they stretch all the way out and run their legs out front and cross their arms and put, take their arms and run them inside their jumpsuit like they're freezing to death, you know, and they're acting like they're sawing logs, and they could care less. And then all of a sudden, they forgot to turn the phone ringer off. The phone ringer starts ringing on the outside, had a big bell hanging up on the wall, and every time the phone rings, and of course, there's nobody in there to answer the phone. And so finally somebody gets in there to answer the phone and they're like, hey, I'm sorry, didn't know, we were supposed to turn that off, but she didn't turn it off when she left and didn't tell him, uh, oh, oh, okay, thank, thank you, appreciate it, you know. And then things begin to settle down and the guys stir around just a little bit and he goes a little bit further in the message and then all of a sudden, for whatever the reason is, the fire alarm goes off and starts that meh, 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 meh. Here she comes out the door again. False alarm, sorry. We didn't mean, I, I don't, don't pay any attention to that. There's no fire alarm. I'll get it reset in just a second. Settles back down. Two ladies come in the very back of the thing back there and one of them says very loudly, as she says, what is all of this right here? I've got to meet with so-and-so and meet with so-and-so. And they say, well, uh, this is an old guy and he's a preacher, so-and-so. And nothing they said was wrong, but all of it, they're talking so loud in a concrete floor with a terrazzo floor and concrete walls and no carpet in there and nothing to absorb the sound. You can imagine, man. I mean, that stuff's bouncing around there like a ping pong ball in a, in a box car. And he just keeps on drawing and that kind of a thing. And he turns around one time and he's drawing this way like that and he's looking for a piece of chalk and he goes over here and he bends over to pick up the chalk and all of a sudden out of nowhere, the board, there's a pool table right in front of him right here, all of a sudden the board just goes, bam, it hits the pool table. And so I got up, you know, and I got to setting the thing back up and I got everything going. He's just like this, he's just continuing on like nothing's going on. And we get done and we get down to the end of that thing and I thought, well, man, this is going to be a bust, man, with all the interruptions and all the stuff happening. This is just going to be something else. Get to the invitation. Let's get out of here because they've already blown it. And we come down to the end of that invitation. He gives an invitation and it gets quiet, boy, like he used to say as a turkey farm on Thanksgiving. And it got quiet and boy, it got still in there. And the next thing you know, those guys with their legs that had been stretched out there, they all of a sudden pull them legs up and then before long, their arms are out of those jumpsuit and they're down there and they're bending over. And there was a half a dozen of those guys that got saved that day. And we got in the car, uh, got in the van and got everything packed up and it was hotter than blazes. It was in August and I got everything packed up like that. And he said, yeah, man, boy, I got to uh, meet you. No, not all, you know. And I said, what was that? And you know, he said, what was what? And I said, all that stuff going on in there. <laughs> he said, that was a battle for those six boys that got saved. And he said, what you have to learn by that is, is when those things happen, not to be distracted by one of the, the devil's greatest tricks. He said, if I'd have stopped what I was doing and responded to the phone, responded to the fire alarm, responded to the ladies in the back, back there talking and responded to the, the board falling over and all that. He said, six boys, if I'd have been sitting there, may not have got another chance. He said, you can't take that stuff personal. Now, this will upset some of you, but he said, you can't take some of that personal boy. I, I, I mean, I took that. I thought, you know, I appreciate that, but I never forgot that. You know what happens? If you get ready to, you start really trying to win souls, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have contention. I wonder sometimes if the contention I have is because I'm trying to win souls or because of stupidity. I wonder if the contention that the church experiences is because we're trying to win souls or because of stupidity. I wonder if maybe we've taken our eyes off the ball. Amen. Amen. 
I come from a long line of back, way back in the day, big church buildings and stuff like that, where I can still remember in my day when I was young as some of these here, I can remember people at the end of a church service. I can remember them walking down an aisle and trusting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and making it public in front of everybody. Nowadays, most people get saved in an office somewhere or in a room somewhere or whatever, and they may come up to join the church later or to get baptized, but there's not that public thing anymore. I just wonder if it's because the contention, we've become quiet. Yes, sir. Not everybody is a great witness when it comes to having results, but everybody is a witness yes. Amen. of one kind or another. Yes. I used to know a fellow, his name was, uh, I, I called him Mr. Jimmy. I can't think of his last name. I was thinking about it last night while I was looking at this, Mr. Jimmy. And Mr. Jimmy, uh, every week he was always, you could see him out in front of the church and he would stand out there. So back when we go down to downtown, Mr. Jimmy, he'd be walking back and forth in front of the church, in front of the church, in front of the church. And so I asked somebody one day, what's that guy doing, man? He looks like he's nervous as he can be. I mean, he's pacing all the time. Oh, Mr. Jimmy's always got somebody new coming to church every week and he meets them out front and he stands out there and waits on them until they show up. Hey. I'm sorry I asked the question. You say, why? When's the last time you stood out front and waited on somebody that you hardly even knew and invited them to come to church, expected them to come and stood out there and waited them so you could escort them in and sit them down? Amen. Too much contention, isn't there? I mean, doesn't your job get in the way? Sure. Doesn't life get in the way? Amen. I mean, you're good people. You love the Lord. You believe the book. You rightly divide. You're, you know, Bible-believing, King James only, that kind of, right? I mean, you attend church. You're faithful members. When was the last time you stood out there waiting? Preacher, I got somebody new coming today. I got somebody new coming today. You had three people that were here today that were lost as a golf ball in high weeds that people had been asking and had been asking and been asking and been asking and they finally today of all days decided to show up. You say, well, what happened? Well, there was a lot of contention. But when was the last time you did that? I'm not saying you're not doing it. I'm just asking you, when was the last time that was number one on your list? instead of who you're going to see in your class or who you're going to talk to about whatever or who's going to make the Starbucks run or whatever. I mean, why are you here? I'm waiting on somebody to come, man. They're, they're coming. I, I'm hoping they come today. And they're coming today. They're coming today. And you'd be surprised how many times you get your mind on something other than the main thing. Amen. When's the last time you asked somebody to come to church? Amen. Amen. Good. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not even saying to you, ladies and gentlemen, that you've got to take them down. I don't give classes on the Romans road. It's not a bad road. I mean, I get it. It can work for the Romans, so it's okay. I mean, you can take somebody down the Romans road, but how about this? How about you just tell them what God did for you and invite them to come to church? If you can't afford to buy them a hamburger or take them out to Outback or whatever, I'll give you the money to take them to lunch. Amen. You say, why? You're trying to get to know them. You say, what's going to happen? Contention. And when you bring them in here, I can assure you there's gonna, they're going to run into somebody that they don't particularly see things the way they see things. You say, why? You were a whack-a-mole too before you started coming to church. Amen. Every one of us was a nut job for Jesus. Right. Every one of us. Yeah. And over a period of time, the Lord's pulled a few fleas off of us. And so now all of a sudden the problem is we think we got it all down pat now. Yeah. But we've lost that desire. You say, why? Because of the contention. It works against your flesh. The last time you sat down at the end of a church service on the pew and just sat down there and ran through some scripture with somebody. Right. Instead of running through your latest Facebook posts or Instagram or Snapchat or who's going to be doing what in school or where you're going to go for vacation and all that. When's the last time in church it was about church instead of about your favorite ball team or who won whatever? I'm just asking you. You say, what? Contention distractions, pushback, pressure, anything but the gospel. I don't preach the gospel every week. I'd say the majority of people that have gotten saved when they come to this church, whichever one of these preachers is preaching, if somebody gets saved, it's in spite of whatever we do or say. We oftentimes don't even give a clear presentation of the gospel and people still get saved. You say, what? Well, it's the work of the Holy Ghost. Yes. Sheep are supposed to reproduce sheep. You know why they don't? Too much contention. Good. Amen. 
Paul said, I didn't quit in spite of the contention. Can you understand the amount of contention? I mean, you want to talk about difficulty. That is a Jew going against his own people, going to people that despised him. I mean, be entirely different if you show up over there and people, they're glad to see you. Paul said, with much contention. Look in verse number three. For the exhortation was not of deceit, nor uncleanness, nor guile. Now I'll just cover that real quick. We, we hit that this morning. Paul's pattern of being able to talk when he's talking about his witness, hey, he doesn't do anything deceitful. Make it out to be something it's not. We covered that this morning in Sunday school. And don't, don't promise people when they come that if you just come to church and read your Bible and pray, everything will get fixed. I'm trying to help somebody right now and honest to the Lord that made me if God doesn't supernaturally intervene. I, I, I don't know what's going to happen with it. They can read uh, enough Bible to sink a battleship. That's not always the answer to all the problems. I didn't say don't read your Bible. But what did you have to tell them, preacher? I had to tell them, hey, if God don't fix it, it ain't going to get fixed. I can't lie to somebody and say, well, if you just do this, and that's, the, that's what the Catholic Church does. Amen. Now, if you're Catholic, just hear me out, please, and don't be offended. And if you're Catholic, please don't walk out the door and get upset because I'm the one bringing contention. But they tell you that you can have your sins forgiven and you can be absolved of those sins by saying so many Our Fathers and so many Hail Marys and doing something as far as penance is concerned and then everything's over and done and everything's going to be fine. And it's not. And if you give a certain amount of money, you can move your loved one from out of purgatory and move them into eternity and they lie to you. That's deceitful. They make long prayers for the people and they wind up making a person a two-fold child of hell. That's deceitful. Be truthful with people. The truth hurts enough in and of itself without attitude that goes with it. Truth is a hard thing to swallow. You know the hardest truth in that Bible? The truth where God says you're the man. It's not hard to accept the truth that the Muslims are wrong, Catholics and Charismatics are wrong, Church of Christ is wrong, and all the lists of all the religions. That's not a hard truth for us. Why? Because we're on the receiving end. We're right and they're all wrong. <laughs> it's those truths where the Lord says, let all anger and wrath and evil speaking be put away with you with all matters and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed the day of redemption and forgiving others as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's a tough enough truth without being mean with it. He said, not deceitful. Don't promise people their problems will be over if they get saved. Your problems are not over. How many of you are saved here tonight? Now leave your hands up if your problems are over. Well, there's no hands up. You say, why? It doesn't solve all your problems down here. He says not only as far as deceit is concerned there in that passage, but uncleanness. We talked about that a little bit. And then guile, that's trickery. That's, that's getting worldly in your conversation, getting too close to the edge, getting too, uh, I, I used to use a word in the pulpit and I, I, I thought it was okay to use the word and it's a very common word and it's an ordinary word, but it degraded the level of the pulpit. And it showed ignorance on my part that I didn't have enough ability to have command of the English language enough to come up with a different word to feel like I had to say something that way. And we were in that old building over there and a little kid did something and the kid, he knocked the thing off the, one of those tables out there that they had all the stuff on and knocked the stuff down there. And when he did, he let the same word out of, the, out of his mouth that I had said in the pulpit. And I happened to be standing right there and I... Pretty sure that it was probably the Lord that knocked the stuff off the table. But at bottom line is, as he said it, and the mother reached out and grabbed him by the arm like that and said, boy, and he's the first thing he said was, preacher says it. Now, it's not a curse word. But it's loose. It's on the edge. Can I not? learn or have more command of my vocabulary than to drive home a point with slang. I'm not trying to be sophisticated, but I said right there, and you see me catch myself every now and then. 
I try not to even refer to your posterity, uh, pos your, 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 uh, the thing you sit upon. I've tried not to do that. You say, why? It tends to lower things. I, I, I don't, I don't want to do, I'm supposed to be preaching. And then too much of that slang, that stuff comes in. It's, it's unclean. It's, you know, sometimes there's a preacher that I know that he'll tell a joke and, and the way he tells the joke, you're thinking, man, I don't know if I'm at one of them stand-up clubs or not. This just doesn't feel like the right place to be saying things. And he didn't say anything wrong, but he painted a picture. You say, what is that? That's uncleanness. What is guile? Guile is nothing but trickery. That's able to command the language where you're able to, to fool people the way you talk. You can talk plain, though, without being crude. Yes. Paul said, though we were rude in speech. That doesn't mean rude in the sense of demeaning speech. It means he talked commonly. You know why? Because Paul was a lawyer and he knew how to use words that his congregation couldn't understand. You ever been in to talk with a doctor, especially somebody that's a specialist in a particular area, and they pull out words this long? And if you don't have a thesaurus there or have a dictionary there or can't ask Google what in the cat hair that means, then you're all of a sudden, hey, doc, can you just do me a favor? Put that in layman's terms. I, I'm not a doctor. I haven't learned it. Tell me what you mean by that word. Do you understand? Guile is an ability to be able to fool people and use words and things like that that trick people into something. That's not how you're supposed to talk to people. It's okay to be plain with people, be upfront with people. But can I say this with all due respect? Your language is loose. And I don't want you to learn that from me. You're watching too much YouTube. You're watching too much television. You're watching too much of what you... You're not learning it here. I know the Sunday school teachers, and I know these guys. They don't talk that way. You're not learning that here. You're learning that by looking at worldly stuff. And before long, I walk by, and I hear how you're talking to each other. And I hear these young men and these young boys, I hear how they're talking. You say, what is that? They're picking up that loose language. Your language is loose. There's nothing wrong with educating yourself well enough that you don't have to use foul language to make your point. Amen. Amen. That's the epitome of weakness when you conform to that. Well, preacher, you know, every now and then, okay, we'll ask the Lord to forgive you and try to do better next time. But... When you have to do that to make a point, you've run out of something to say. I grew up in a time where you never heard a school, a school teacher in any level from time you were in kindergarten all the way through graduating and until you got into college, you never heard a school teacher ever use a curse word or a foul word. And nowadays it's just as common as the day is long. You walk through Walmart, I used to be shocked because I'd hear women talking like men. And nowadays, I hear kids saying that stuff. Them in Walmart a couple of weeks ago, and the kid turned around to his mom and said something, and I'm thinking, oh my Lord, have mercy, they're going to call the meat wagon man. That kid's going to get killed right here. And that kid turned around and made a gesture at his mom and said something, and I thought, she, I don't, public place or not, she's going to kill him right here on the spot. I mean, loud. And she just like, you know, looked at him and she said, well, same to you too. And I'm, I thought, I said, we just need to get out of here, man. But that language shouldn't be known among you. Don't be telling me what to do. I'm telling you what to do. You can do what you want to do, but you shouldn't be doing that. Not just in church. You shouldn't be known by foul language. So what is that? It's uncleanness. And come down to verse number four. But as we were allowed of God to put in trust with the gospel, even so speak we not pleasing men, but God, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Now, I want you to grab a couple of things there in verse number four. Trustworthy. You don't need to add anything to the gospel. Amen. Amen. If the death, burial and resurrection doesn't do it, then the death, burial and resurrection doesn't do it. 
Trustworthy to do what? Preach what God told you to preach. Say what God told you to say. When you're witness to somebody, you witness to somebody how that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, was buried and raised again the third day according to Scripture. You can give a testimony what he did, but trustworthy means God can trust you with the gospel to give the unadulterated gospel. That just simply means un, un, uh, unsullied. It, it's not been uh, um, stomped on. Uh, way back in the day, a bajillion years ago, back in my days, heroin and brown tar heroin come up out of uh, Mexico and things like that. And then regular cocaine. Cocaine was a rich man's uh, drug back in those days. And what they would do is they would bring it up and they'd bring it up in the bricks the way you've seen all the stuff. I'm sure you've seen it. And then they found a way outside of baking soda to find this particular powder. And I'm not going to tell you what it was. And what they would do is they would step on it. And that's what they called it. And it would still be cocaine, mostly cocaine, but they would water down and they'd get four or five, six times the amount out of it by mixing something with it. Well, when you do that stuff to the, to the gospel, you take the power out of it. Amen. It's fine like it is, present it like it is, and if they don't accept it, it's the gospel doing the work. You're not doing the work anyway. Don't ever placate, don't ever cater to an individual that says, you know, well, I just don't really believe that. Well, I mean, I know what we say about hell and we have to say that to you, but the Lord, does, no, no, don't, don't sugarcoat that. You're trying to save their soul from hell. You don't have to be a jerk about it and grit your teeth, but ladies and gentlemen, could you at least just tell them, listen, I really want to see you get saved. I wouldn't want you to burn in a devil's hell forever. But to try to loosen up, lighten up, well, we don't need to talk about hell. What he's talking about is separation from God. I'm listening to a guy the other day watching one of these end of the world uh, uh, movies like a, like a rapture movie thing. And the guy, it's about a, about a little boy that got saved. And I can't remember the name of the deal. And they got this preacher in there and he's preaching and he starts off and he's giving the gospel. And I mean, he's laying it down the pipe, man. And I'm thinking, well, praise the Lord, boy, he's getting at it. There, this is a, a, one of those uh, uh, movies. A, it's a cloud, cloud movie thing. It's not from the computer thing. I'm trying to remember where, anyway, <clears throat> no cussing in it or nothing like that. And I'm listening to this guy give it and I'll be jumped. He comes right down to the end of that. And he says, well, and he says, if you don't do that, there's eternal separation from God. And I thought, what a bummer, man. Why'd you have to say that? Come on, preacher. Why'd you have to say that? I can tell you why you say that. You keep people coming. It is not eternal separation from God alone. It's burning in hell and then come out, stand judgment and go back to the lake of fire. Well, preacher, that's unpopular. See, trustworthy. Can he trust you with it? How'd you get saved? You got saved trust in Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. By grace you saved through faith, that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If that's not going to, it's so simple, a child can get it. Amen. Don't make it so sophisticated they can't get it. Can he trust you with the gospel? Do you know you're considered to be an ambassador for him? Right. Amen. Maybe we've forgotten that. When I was coming up, I was part of a thing called Royal Ambassadors for Christ. It's a Southern Baptist thing and all that kind of a deal. And you say all you want to say about the Southern Baptist. They had a program for just about everything and all that. Uh, they had GAs uh, for the girls and RAs for the, the, uh, the uh, guys. And went to this big convention and everybody had to wear a shirt and a tie and all. And you go to this big convention and it's about soul winning and winning people to the Lord and living right and doing right. And remembering that you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And I was in junior high school at the time and they loaded us all up on a bus and that kind of a deal, not air conditioned, a school bus. The air condition was you put the windows down and drove 50 miles an hour, stuck your head out the window. When you showed up, you had on a shirt and tie and sweat all over you. And you thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, that old church, you know, the first Billy Graham crusade I went to, it was from our church. We took bus loads of people, school buses to a Billy Graham concert, or concert, to a Billy Graham crusade and went to a baseball field and sat way back up in the nosebleed section up there. I remember looking over the back of that thing and think, man, if you were to jump off this thing, you'd die sure enough. And I can remember feeling him reaching out there. Boy, I was already saved. I can remember him at that invitation time as if he had his fingers around my neck and saying, you need to come on, you need to come on, you need to come on. I mean, the power of God filling that place like you can't imagine and people streaming down there and coming down there and all that. You say, what was that? That was a church trip. 
We stayed stuck in that cotton picking parking lot for I can't tell you how, how long, but we were all just, you know, we thought it was the greatest thing in the world. Well, we went over to this Royal Ambassadors thing, just a bunch of knot-headed boys and stuff like that, and a bunch of men that cared enough about trying to make an impact on us and taking us up there to learn uh, about how to witness to people and about how to live for Jesus Christ and uh, be a, become a Royal Ambassador. They made you feel like somebody if you were purveying the gospel. Oh, I know, I know the stuff they're using you to get out there to try to get people in the church. If you get the kids, you get the parents, and you keep the machine rolling and so on and so forth. Yeah, but you know what? At least they were trying to do something to win souls instead of just throwing stones at everybody trying to win souls. These folks go down to the fair. Why would you go to the fair? What good does it do to the fair? They're trying to win souls. Why don't you join them? Are you embarrassed to win a soul? You say, well, preacher, why is that important? Because it's the number one thing you're here for. You're an ambassador for Christ. You're not here to make a name for yourself. We're not here to make a name for our church. We're here to do what? The Lord said, of all the people and all the places and all the things and all the angels and all the ways, I could give the most important thing. I'm going to make you, I'm going to put you in trust with the gospel. Can he trust you with it? Good. Not to keep it and bury it in the ground, but to get out and do something with it, to invest it. Amen. Learn how to witness. You learn how to do jobs so you can get promotions, don't you? Well, what's wrong with learning? Getting around some of these old white-headed people and bald-headed people and people that have been around and they got a, a shed built over the top of their shoes now. Why not you, some of you youngins get around them and say, how do you win somebody to Jesus? Right. Instead of, uh, let's, how do you take care of somebody you don't like? Right. And have a, a, you understand what I'm trying to get across to you? I mean, you say, what is that? Preacher, that's basic stuff. Well, then we fail the basics. We need to go back to fundamentals. I haven't known many, many of them. My dad would have been one, and my dad knew dozens and dozens of them. But I haven't known that many myself personally. But every professional athlete I've ever known, there's two things they do that are amazing to me. Uh, number one, or maybe three, they always start every year, the beginning of the season, they start back with the fundamentals. That's every sport that I've ever known a professional athlete in. They always start back with fundamentals. The second thing that impresses me is, is that when practice is over for everybody else, they just start practice. Just because the coach blows a whistle and said we're done, they stay out and continue to work. They tell me it's because they're less likely to make a mistake when the pressure's on if they practice with reputation. But the third thing that's probably the most impressive to me about all of it is, is that whatever this, this sport is that they're involved in, is they always work on their weakness. That's the difference that a professional athlete told me, a professional ball player that played here for Jaguars, he said basically other than being given a God-given talent and a work ethic, he said basically the difference in a, a good amateur and a professional is, is a good amateur will continually improve what he's good at and he'll never work on what he's weak on. And he said a professional athlete will review hours and hours and hours of game films and find where he's weak and work on that weakness until that weakness at least comes up to the level of his strengths. That's a mouthful. Well, what are you weak at? I don't know what your weakness is. I couldn't tell you. But if your weakness is witnessing, do you work at it? Do you try? Do you make an effort? Do you learn other ways to go about it? I mean, how to get a door open? How to figure out how much and how far? You don't have to blast everybody like you're street preaching to them. But the Apostle Paul recognizes there's something that I need to learn how to do. And he said, I've been put in trust with it and I'm not doing it to please men. I'm doing it for the purpose of pleasing God. Excuse me, I've seen plenty of rebels utilize that verse and use that to run over people. What he's saying there is, is that if I'm going to say something and do something for God, some men are not going to be pleased with it. 
That doesn't mean that you're getting the contention if you're witnessing on your boss's time. That's not what we're talking about. That's not standing on the corner on somebody's private property and the police come up there and tell you you can't do that and you say that you're being persecuted for Christ's sake. You're being persecuted for being stupid. That's not saying that when it comes time to witness that you men always seem to find a female to witness to. You're using the Lord to try to talk to a female. Why don't you witness to a man? But I wonder, can you be trusted with it? Or do you change it a little bit? Fix it where it's a little bit more comfortable so it's more pleasing for people to hear. Can I say this about you? That old preacher used to say that thing, that the gospel has three points negative. Remember how he would do that? It's three points negative. Do you remember that? Do you even remember that? How that Christ died, negative, for your sins, negative, was buried, negative, and rose again the third day, positive. That's, you, you can't help that. Trustworthy is, I got to give them the truth. You can do it with a smile on your face. You can do it in earnest. My mama, my Lord have mercy, that woman would witness to a telephone pole. And it wasn't just because her husband was a pastor. He'd been dead 30 years. She's still writing letters and sending tracts in the mail and calling. If you were to call over there right now, I thought about doing it tonight, dialing her number and she'd tell you who it is and all that. And at the very end of that thing, she would say, and remember, God really does love you. That was the story of her life. Well, you're just bragging on your mama. I am bragging on my mama. I'm under conviction by my mama. My mama would talk to her entire Sunday school class one at a time, take them out to lunch, sit down with them, tell me when you got saved, tell me what happened to you when you got saved, how did you get saved, write them letters, talk to them, spend time with them. She taught a Sunday school class. I ran into one lady there, had been teaching. She said, your mama taught my Sunday school class for 15 years. She never changed. Amen. What do you think about that? I think that she'll get up there in heaven and the Lord will say, I sure appreciate being able to trust you with the gospel and not getting all tore up and everything else. Can he trust you with the gospel? I mean, kind of straight away from it, hadn't we? Use the church to make connections so that we can get whatever it is we need to get instead of getting more sinners to come in. And talk about the church is dwindling and people are leaving and churches are not what they used to be and all that kind of stuff. Hey, that's not the world's fault. That's it. We've quit being ambassadors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just not really a witness. The Lord said you are. Can I give you a verse of scripture for it? I can do all things through Christ, which you can be a witness. You just don't want to be. Amen. You don't really care about people you don't know. Starting with your family is not a great place to start. A prophet is not without honor save in his own country. Many of you have been praying and witnessing to your family for years and years and years and years and they're still not saved. But ladies and gentlemen, learning how to do that, I'm not telling you it becomes easier. I'm telling you it's right. And God said, can I trust you with it? Well, if he trusts you with it, you know what he wants you to do? He wants you to do something with it. Don't bury it in the ground. Amen. Now, I know I can read because it's coming across your head right now. And what's coming across your head right now is, is, well, the only reason he's hitting us about witnessing is because he's wanting to fill up the building. Well, the Lord's been doing a pretty good job at filling up the building without us doing our part. But it is time that we at least take a look at what Paul says, if it's his pattern. You know where Paul went? He went places nobody else would go. Right. And he witnessed to people that nobody wanted anything to do with. Right. I'm not ashamed to tell you what I'm about to tell you, but I do want you to clearly understand after being a policeman for years and years and years and years and years, do you know what it was like for me to go into prisons? and visit people who were rightfully locked up. Do you have any idea how <clears throat> strange that is? I helped to put them there, and they deserve to be there, 
and now I'm trying to tell them about Jesus. Now, maybe that wouldn't be a hurdle for you. You'd be like, yeah, I'm good with that. No, no problem at all. But I struggled with that. I got made fun of for that. Oh, you're going to go in there and give them a little Jesus? Yeah. Well, they don't deserve Jesus. I didn't say they deserve to get out, but their soul deserves to be saved. You say, what is that? You don't think that's an odd thing or odd situation? I'm not the poster child for it. I fight it as much as you do. Some of them in there, the Lord says, go in there and witness to them. I don't want to witness to them. I don't care if they rot. The Lord said, that's my soul. Go in there and witness. Paul is witnessing to people that you would not have what you have in your lap right now if he didn't go to people that nobody else liked. You don't get to just witness to people you like. I'm going to ask you something here. I'm going to close here in just a second. But I'm going, to ask you, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to put at the top of your prayer list, Lord knows we got stuff going on. Richard's over there. He'll be there till probably, I think, about Tuesday or so, going back for a checkup for rehab. And if he gets out and he gets to go to rehab, then he's got to be in rehab a while before he does all the other kind of things. We got other kind of people that are going through sickness and problems and trouble and trials. And I, get, I, get, I understand all of that. I'm going to ask you to put above that whole thing right there at the very top before you get into your laundry list of everything you want. I'm going to ask you to put this at the top of your list. Lord, could you give me somebody to witness to this week? I didn't say give me a soul. I didn't say that. I said, Lord, could you give me somebody to witness to this week? I mean, a clear witness. I mean, no, the Lord ran them across your path and the Lord turned the light on them and said, okay, there you go, that one right there. Now, I want you to put right underneath that whoever you want to send my way. Now, you might be surprised. It might be somebody that you don't like or care for. I used to deal a whole bunch with bums and people that were down that were drunks and detox and uh, different places like that and puke and vomit all over them and soil their clothes and, and stuff like that. You may think that that's an easy thing to do, but to put them in your car and then when you get done to stuff a track in their pocket so when they sober up they got something to... That's not as easy as you might think it is. You say, why? You want somebody like that coming to your church? Well, preacher, what good does it do the church? You're missing it. It's not about doing something for the church. Amen. It's not about filling a pew. It's about doing something for Jesus Christ. I guarantee you, if you'll get a burden for souls, you know what would be in my, you'd be surprised. You'll be blind in one eye and can't see out of the other one, man. I mean, you'll be deaf in one ear and the other ear, you've got to have a hearing aid to be able to hear anything. You say, why? Well, you get a burden for souls like the Lord did, you'd be surprised what it'll do for your Christian life. You don't have time to worry about all the other stuff. I'm talking about every time you get ready to pray, Lord, you give me somebody to witness to? Can I tell you this? It may be somebody you don't like. And can I tell you this? It might be an inconvenient time. When you have something else that's going on and the Lord said, okay, right here, here you go, right here. Now, why don't you just try it and see what the Lord does for you. You might be surprised if all of a sudden it's what we call low-hanging fruit. All of a sudden that thing's hanging there and it drops in your lap and you're thinking, well, man, there was nothing to that. The Lord just wanted you to go by there and get the harvest. But in all the prayers you've prayed, when was the last time you prayed for a soul? I thought you could be trusted with the gospel. Well, preacher, you know, we'll bring them and you get, okay. You bring them, I'll give it to them. That'll be fine with me. I'm not talking about bringing them to church. I'm talking about you personally. Preacher, what do I say? You give them your testimony. That's what Paul did. It stops you in your tracks, doesn't it? it? Makes you think, my goodness, man. Can you imagine how many people in here? I don't know what's in here tonight. Not as many in here tonight as there was this morning. This morning you're starting to already get things filled up and stuff like that. But here's the thing. If everybody brought one in a year, you'd be punching out the other part of these walls up here. Why shouldn't it be that way? I can tell you why it will not be that way if people don't do and not, can't be trusted with the gospel. It's because we don't do our part. It isn't because the Lord's done with his part. 
Well, we're in the gleaning, preacher. You know how that is? You're lazy. That's what you're saying. Just admit it. You don't want to tell them about Jesus. Just admit it. Just admit you don't, just admit you don't want to give it face to face. Just admit it. Don't, don't try to make it something that, that it's not. But could you ever pause to think? Okay, preacher, I'm going to try it. This week, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pray every day, every time I pray for the Lord to give me a chance to witness. To witness. To witness. Don't, don't worry. I'm not going to call. Brother Dan, did you get a chance to witness this week? Praise the Lord. Give us a little testimony. Tell us how that was. Oh, preacher, it was great, man. Down there on death row in Florida. And I got to do it. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, Lord, give me a chance to witness. I guarantee you if he gives you a chance to witness, he'll give you the power to witness. And you'll plug into something that'll change your life. And all of a sudden you'll realize you get a convert on the line, man, and put one in the boat. You know what you'll think? I'm enjoying this fishing. I just pulled somebody out of the devil's backyard. And before long you say, you know what? I want to go fishing again. I want to go fishing again. Can you tell me how to catch more fish? You'll get to where you like it. But you're afraid of it. You never ask the Lord to help you with it. I'm going to stop right there, but are you trustworthy? Can you be counted on? Preacher, you're going to give us a soul winning class? Here's the illustration and I'll close. I'll still get you out of here by six o'clock. That was the goal. Uh, I'll give you an illustration. The Lord meets a woman over there. She's not a good woman. She's a malcontent, a misfit. She's a home wrecker, whatever you want to call her, in John chapter number four. And when he meets her there by the well, and after he gets finished with the transaction there and gives her a drink where she'll never thirst again and all that, he doesn't say to that woman, now you go into that town and you go tell everybody what I've done for you. He doesn't say that. But you know what she does? She goes back into town and with no new members class and with no Romans road, Romans wasn't even written, <laughs> and with no uh, soul winning class, you know what she does? She goes into that town. You know what she says? She says, you need to come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Amen. Those apostles are in the same town. They come back with food for themselves. She comes back with the entire town. Who taught her to do that? But when she ran headlong into Jesus, Jesus did something for her. And you know what she said? I talk a lot about a lot of things, but I ain't shutting my mouth about that. Has Jesus ever done anything for you? When was the last time you told somebody? Personal testimony. What did he do for you? When I was seven years old. I was messing around my roast beef and English peas and the Lord dealt with me and I didn't want to go to hell and I got saved. Terraza floor, Miami, Florida, corner of the table there, sweat running down the tea glass there. Mom and brother and sister run out the door with the stupid dog and all that. And I'm sitting there and got my dad's hold of my hand there and I bowed my head and bent my knees and asked Jesus Christ to save me. Well, preacher, that's not enough. If that ain't enough, it is enough. What did you get saved from? Hell. It's got all the elements you need. Now I'm going to challenge you. You want a motivational speech? Here's a motivational speech. I'm going to challenge you. Are you a Christian? Yes, sir. I'm a Christian. Shirt and tie. Three-quarter length sleeves dress below my knees, just enough makeup on the barn to make sure that it, you know, doesn't show its age. No, no, are you a Christian? Do you tell others about the one that saved you? If you were to go to court today, and the only thing that would point to whether or not you were a Christian is whether or not you told others, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I didn't say your church attendance. I didn't say your Bible reading. I didn't say your prayer life. I said if the only standard by which you could be convicted was whether or not you told other people about Jesus Christ, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or would the jury come back and go, that guy ain't no Christian. 
He didn't mention one time in his entire testimony about who he had tried to win to Jesus Christ and who he had witnessed to and what he had done for missions and missionaries. He didn't mention that at all. All he did was talk about everything he did and all the other stuff and what's wrong with everybody else and this and that and the other. No, there's no evidence to convict that individual. If the only thing was you telling somebody, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I mean preachers too. And if not, what say we change it? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we sure do appreciate we go through the life of Paul and see what a great pattern he was and how.